The very word triad invokes a deep sense of mystery. Digging at the surface, we find the most obvious layer, crime. What kind of crime you may ask? Drugs. During the Qing Dynasty's ill-fated attempt to ban opium, the triads would flip their cash and make a pretty penny smuggling opium from the British into the Chinese mainland. But opium is so 19th century, introducing China White. Heroin refined from the highest quality poppy seeds grown in the Golden Triangle of Southeast Asia itself. While G.I. Joes get their first hit of the stuff machine gunning the jungles of Vietnam, the triads set up operations to service the new wave of customers heading back and so starts the American opioid crisis. Then there's human trafficking. During the 19th century, triads were seen as a legitimate method for helping immigrants leave China and settle into the sprawling Chinatowns all across the world. As we mentioned in my previous video on the Taiping Rebellion, the Hakka ethnic group of China was a particularly persecuted group in China, especially after that whole Chinese Jesus thing. More on that in this video. And so the loving and helpful triads helped them escape. Except, the loving and helpful triads weren't so loving and helpful. Newly arriving immigrants would be extorted, forced into debt, or coerced into prostitution, and the triads would hold an iron grip over many of the world's Chinatowns in the same way the Mafia did Little Italy. But that's old news. New news is that nothing's changed. Up to 100,000 people are trafficked into the US every year by the triads. Lastly, there's money laundering. Despite the Communist Party's strict capital outflow laws meant to keep money from finding greener pastures, these big regulations only apply to little people. And that means unless you're a sucker, rules aren't meant to be followed, even if you made them. So how do you get around these laws you made to be applied to everyone except yourself? Easy. Enlist the help of your local friendly triad that run one of Macau's many casinos to help you wash your money clean. But there's more to this criminal network than meets the eye. If I were to ask you what you think their main goal is, you'd say money, right? Well, correct. But that's not the whole story. What if I told you the Triads are an underground secret society hell-bent on restoring the long-dead Ming Dynasty that collapsed 400 years ago? Hey guys. It's David G here. Welcome back to another video. I know I lost you in that last part, but before you find your way again, make sure to smash that like button. Let's begin. Now before I get into the topic, I need to give a bit of a history lesson for context. You ever notice there's a common theme in Chinese history that goes something like, this person betrayed that person, so that person retaliates by killing him, his family, his friends, anyone associated with him until tens of thousands of people are killed. That seems a bit extreme, right? But it's a common theme throughout Chinese history. Why? One word, loyalty. Of the Chinese Confucian traditions, arguably the most important edict is loyalty. The sense of loyalty a subject can have to his lord is unyielding. Sure, you get some bad eggs here and there, but the very notion of loyalty to your master is deeply caked into your upbringing, so much so that it was the very fabric that bound a Confucian-based society together. So if you're an enemy of, say, the current ruling dynasty and you happen to defeat them, what is the only foreseeable way to uproot this old power structure and consolidate power? With waves and waves of massacres, of course, until anyone with the tiniest fond memory of the last dynasty is culled. Well, that's exactly what happened when the non-ethnic Chinese Manchus, also known as the Qing Dynasty, did when they toppled the Ming Dynasty in 1662 AD. There's a lot of love for the Ming. They ousted the very long-hated Mongol Yuan Dynasty after a hundred years of foreign occupation, and its golden age is noted for good governance, liberal political policies, economic prosperity, and domestic stability. But, most importantly, it was Chinese. Han Chinese. After throwing off the yoke of their Mongol overlords over 300 years later, the Chinese would have the yoke put back on them by another foreign adversary, the Manchus. Like the Mongols, the Manchus were not Han Chinese, and the new overlords would make that clear. From the very time they took power, they endeavoured not to be Sinicized, but instead to make everyone else Manchu. As a symbol of subservience, all Chinese men and young boys were forced to shave their traditionally long hair and make a queue, a uniquely Manchu custom. 
or face the consequences. Lose your hair or lose your head, as they would say. Whilst the Ming dynasty had been culled and driven almost to extinction, a deep sense of loyalty to the Ming and to the ethnic Han Chinese way spurred on former loyal ministers, generals and aristocrats into resistance. The resistance most notably took place on the island of Taiwan, but after the island was captured by the Qing 20 years later, the Ming loyalist movement went underground way underground. These underground movements were all over South China, but they were all united by one phrase, Fan Qing Fu Ming, overthrow the Qing, restore the Ming. Every movement, gesture and wording of their sentences would become a carefully choreographed code in order to relay messages to each other without arousing suspicion and allow them to openly convey their messages in public. First, the name. The Hongmen is the name given to these decentralized Ming loyalist groups. Why the character Hong? There are a few reasons why. One is that Hong is the name shared by the first Ming emperor, Emperor Hongwu. But most importantly is that the character Hong has a special code embedded into it. The traditional character for Han, referring to the Han Chinese, is displayed this way. The character is made up of a number of components called radicals. In the center we see the radical for middle, Zhong. The same Zhong used in the word Zhongguo, China. Below that is the radical for land. If we remove both of these radicals, we get the character Hong. What's being implied is better described by the often spoken saying of the Hongmen, Han Shi Zhong Tu, the Han have lost the middle land, referring to China, which is known as the Middle Kingdom. So as to say, the Han have lost China. And thus, the character Han is replaced with the character Hong, representing a people robbed of its land, history and culture. Now there are many different Hongmans, but what unites them all is the desire to overthrow the Qing. But of these Hongmans, there is one particular one that would become the ideological foundation for all Hongmans and would unite them in their philosophy, and this was a group called the Heaven and Earth Society. Whilst you and even most Chinese have never heard of this Heaven and Earth Society before, one can't overstate their cultural and historical impact on China for the past 200 years. So who are the Heaven and Earth Society? It was a group founded by underground Ming loyalists who had been deeply influenced by a religious cult called the White Lotus Society and leading members of the Shaolin Temple. That's right, Kung Fu Masters. I understand everything I say right now just creates 5 more threads to go down due to the complexity and lack of knowledge about this subject, so I'll just recap. Ming loyalists, members of a religious cult and kung fu monks all banded together to form a secret society known as the Heaven and Earth Society. When the Shaolin Temple was burnt down by the Qing, the 5 surviving masters of the temple joined with the members of the White Lotus Society and swore to avenge the Han people and destroy the Qing. The group amassed wealth and influence from wealthy donors, particularly from the old Ming aristocracy living in exile and the wealthy Chinese that had immigrated overseas. The Qing had enemies all over China and even all over the world and the Heaven and Earth Society linked up and forged relationships with all these disaffected people and through the Hongmen, they made blood oaths to each other, swearing an oath of fraternity, a code of secrecy under penalty of death and swearing to never rest until at last the evil Qing can be overthrown and the Ming can be restored. Fan Qing, Fu Ming. This is where the street level foot soldiers of the Hongmen would make their debut the triads. The triads, known in Chinese as the San He Hui, got their name in a few ways. First, the basis for the Hongmen's activities was in the Pearl River Delta region of Guangdong, and this river is fed by three rivers. Secondly, in the character Hong, there is the water radical, which is represented by three dots. You can think of them as the three rivers. Lastly, the three unions mentioned in the name refer to heaven, earth, and man, the three powers of the universe as is taught in the White Lotus belief system. Whilst these reasons seem pedantic and meaningless, the key takeaway is that the triads are obsessed with the number three. Three everything, three knocks on a door, visiting and leaving a place three times, picking things up with only three fingers. Such peculiar behavior was picked up by the British law enforcement in Hong Kong and dubbed the mysterious group Triads. When new triad members are initiated, they kneel before an altar of Guan Yu, the god of war who represents unyielding loyalty, and before the members, they recite the oath to overthrow the Qing and restore the Ming. Then they sacrifice an animal, drink its blood, and raise three fingers in the air to complete the ritual. 
With this diehard group of devotees, the Hongmen would use the Triads to deadly effect as insurgents in the numerous conflicts that took place in China over the two and a half centuries of Qing rule. They acted as spies, assassins, agent provocateurs, and street enforcers. However, during the 19th century, the landscape of southern China would become particularly impoverished owing to constant warfare, famine, and drought, and it was during this time that the tribes rose to prominence primarily as gangbangers more than anything else. Despite deeply held humanistic ideals, the tribes would fill the coffers of the Hongmen by becoming career criminals, and in this destitute and impoverished landscape, so many rootless young men would desperately seek to join the tribes in order to make some easy money and potentially achieve a great cause. So with the help of this deeply devoted core of insurgents held bent on overthrowing the Qing, the Heaven and Earth Secret Society would be the greatest threat to the survival of the Qing Dynasty throughout the Qing Dynasty's entire existence. In almost every rebellion that took place within China, the Heaven and Earth Society played a key role in financing, arming, or outright leading disenfranchised rebel factions against the long-hated Qing. One of the most notable examples is how they funded armed and assisted a little-known Christian cult called the Taiping, and guided the ascent of their leader, Hong Shou Chuan, the charismatic guru who claimed to be the brother of Jesus Christ. The Heaven and Earth's most notable achievement can be boiled down to producing one man, the man known as the father of the nation. His name was Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen was a leading figure in the Heaven and Earth Society, and he's credited for helping end not only the Qing Dynasty's 250-year rule in China, but end the very notion of imperial rule in China going back 2,000 years beforehand. Unlike the Heaven and Earth Society's desire for the return to the Ming Dynasty, Sun Yat-sen differed in his belief about the return to imperial greatness. He realized the best path forward for China was forward instead of backwards, and restoring an archaic dynasty from another era would only perpetuate the same problems faced by the Qing. Instead he introduced a new concept that combined the precepts of Han nationalism as followed in the Heaven and Earth Society, but combining it with the Western notion of republicanism which he had learned about during his studies in the West. To realize his vision, he continued receiving aid from the Heaven and Earth Society, but created a new Hongmen called the Revived China Society, the Xing Zhonghui. After the Qing Dynasty was successfully overthrown, the Kuomintang, also known as the Chinese Nationalist Party, was established by members of the Revived China Society to participate in the new democratic process. The following years of imperial free rule in China would be difficult, as a new civil war would erupt shortly thereafter when the first duly elected president of China, Yuan Shikai, assassinated the leader of the KMT and declared himself emperor in order to restore Qing rule. It was during this time that the KMT party would come more into prominence when Sun Yat-sen led the party in resistance to Yuan Shikai. The KMT was militarily weak however, and when they received an offer of support from the Soviet Union, the KMT agreed. You see at the time, the KMT sympathized with the communists and saw them as brothers in arms in the global struggle against imperialism. In exchange for this deal however, the KMT agreed with the Soviets to allow Chinese Communist Party members into their upper ranks and control part of the army. The true intentions of the Chinese Communists came to be known when a Chinese Communist naval officer, in league with the Soviet naval advisor, commandeered the SS Zhongshan without the KMT's permission in order to aid a leftist uprising in Guangdong. This coup against the Republican government led to the mass killing of the Communists by the KMT and ultimately sparked the 22 year long civil war between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party. After the two decade long civil war with the Kuomintang, the Chinese Communist Party finally came out on top from this centuries long power struggle. What's interesting about their origins is that despite the KMT having been their arch nemesis, Sun Yat-sen is still glorified as the father of the nation. As for the Heaven and Earth Society, which was so crucial in the anti-Qing days, it is still respected but a now transparent organization in mainland China and is one of eight legally recognized minor political parties and the only non-communist party in China going by the name the Zhigong Party. It has most likely retained its power due to its early support of the Chinese communists and its long-running connections with the international cabal of Hongmen that is active in almost every nation around the world. After being defeated, the KMT kept up the fight by moving their base of operations to Taiwan. Like the CCP, the KMT also venerates Sun Yat-sen as the founder of the nation, and on Taiwan, they built the republic they failed to create in China. Just like in mainland China, the Heaven and Earth Society maintains its political influence, but unlike the mainland, their political power is much more significant. 
Despite the Hongmen being very active on mainland China and Taiwan, there's clearly been a split in the group's philosophy being either for or against the Chinese Communist Party. The truth is, is what the modern day Hongmen truly stands for now remains just as mysterious as ever as there are still branches that adhere to the notions of Ming revivalism. This Hongmen in Havana, Cuba for example, arrived in 1887, founded its Chinatown and to this day still carries on the traditions of loyalty to the Ming. However, there are many branches of the Hongmen throughout the world that focus on the more esoteric concepts, perhaps in vain with the teachings of the White Lotus Society. What's interesting is that in Western countries, the Heaven and Earth Society operates openly but under another name, the Chinese Freemasons. I visited my local one, but they declined for an interview. Who would have guessed the secret society would be so secretive? And finally, the Triads. After centuries of effort, the Hongmen finally helped topple the hated Qing Dynasty, but despite achieving their long-held goal, life in China remained no less short and brutish, and for these street-level triads, none of these fulfilled promises of a new China afforded them a better life. So carrying on the traditions of the Hongmen, they stood true to their bonds of fraternity, stuck to their code of secrecy, and carried on with their criminal operations as they had done for almost two centuries. Thanks a lot for watching guys, I watch a lot of content related to China on YouTube, but I don't really see any other channel that goes that much into depth about Chinese history, culture or philosophy like here on this channel, and I do believe this channel is pioneering some cutting edge content that hasn't been seen before, so if you want to be part of this channel's rise to the top, click the subscribe button and join me on some more epic adventures. And if you want to overthrow the Qing and restore the glorious Ming Dynasty, go ahead and smash that like button. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you later. Peace.